Well, hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Olesa Kromychuk, and I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London. We're a charity. Um, dedicated to um, explaining Ukraine to audiences in the UK and beyond. And we are really grateful to the Frontline Club for co-organizing this discussion and for hosting it. Um, and I think it's an extremely important discussion. We've got an absolutely fantastic lineup of speakers, all of them joining us online. Um, so thanks for being here present. They can't see you, but um, just to let you know, guys, before I introduce you, there's a room full of people watching you here in London as well as online. Um, before I introduce our panel, I also wanted to say that I'm joined by Nina Murray here, who will be who's a who's a poet and a translator and a writer, and who will be joined uh, who will be translating. Um, into English uh, when Stasa Seyev speaks, when one of the panelists speaks to us. And we are joined remotely as well by Irina Inozemtseva from Ukraine, who is another interpreter uh, who will be translating for Stas simultaneously. So it's quite a, a complicated technical operation with lots of fantastic people making it happen. And many thanks to Nina Watson right in the back from the Frontline Club for making it happen too. So really, our knowledge of what is happening in Ukraine and what has been happening for the last month or over a month now really depends very much on reliable reporting on the ground. And we are extremely lucky to have the speakers tonight um, who contributed significantly to this reliable reporting each in their own way. I will introduce them uh, all uh, right at the start now and then we'll have a brief discussion and then we'll open the floor to questions both here in the room and um, those of you who, who are joining us online as well. So I'll begin with Natalia Humanyuk. Natalia Humanyuk is a Ukrainian journalist and author. She is a founder of the Public Interest Journalism Lab, uh, which promotes constructive discussion around complex social topics. From 2015 to 2020, she headed the independent Ukrainian broadcaster Hromatske TV. I'm sure many of you have heard of them already, and the English language Hromatske International Project. <coughs> Natalia specializes in reporting foreign affairs and conflicts. Um, her book, The Lost Island, The Tales from Occupied Crimea, published in 2020, features her six-year reporting from Russian occupied Crimea. If you haven't had a chance to look at that book, I highly recommend it. Natalia is currently in Zaporizhia. <laughs> And since the start of the full scale invasion, uh, she has reported from Kyiv, Dnipro, Sumy region, Kharkiv, Mykolaiv, Poltava, Uman, Vinnytsia, and Odessa. So uh, we're really looking forward to hearing your impressions of all of these parts of Ukraine, Natalia, soon. We are also joined by Ola Tokaruk, um, who is an independent journalist and non-resident fellow at uh, the Center for European Policy Analysis uh, based in Ukraine. Not, no, Ola is based in Ukraine. Her professional interests include international relations and disinformation research. Olya has vast experience working with Ukrainian and international media. Her reports were published by Time, The Washington Post, The Daily Beast, uh, BuzzFeed's News USA, as well as other um, outlets in the States, in the UK, in Spain, in Italy. Uh, she's a former head of foreign news desk at Romatsky TV. And before the start of the, even before the start of the full scale invasion, she was a frequent voice and face um, in many discussions here in the West, uh, as well, political and media discussions of uh, the war in Ukraine. And she remains uh, an authoritative voice uh, on the situation in Ukraine. We're also joined by Isabel Koshiv. Uh, who is the Guardian's Kyiv correspondent, and she formerly wrote as a freelancer for BuzzFeed News and NV. Uh, Isabel has worked on investigations into transnational crime and corruption, uh, and her investigations have appeared in The Verge, The New York Times, The Financial Times, uh, The Times, and in Kyiv Post. And last but not least, we're joined by Stanislav Aseyev, who is a Donetsk-born um, Ukrainian writer and journalist. Uh, he was based in the occupied uh, city of Donetsk um, and wrote for uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, as well as a number of Ukrainian publications. And in June 2017, uh, Stanislav was captured and unlawfully imprisoned by the Russian proxies militia forces. Uh, he was accused of extremism and spying. 
Uh, in spite of the numerous calls to release Stanislav, he was held captive and subjected to torture for over two and a half years in the infamous uh, Isolatia concentration camp in Donetsk. He was released as part of a prisoner exchange in December in 2019. Um, in 2021, Stanislav Vasiev was awarded the Tarashevchenko National Prize for his book, In Isolation. Um, and it was this book, as well as Stanislav's um, um, ordeal in Isolatia and uh, his reporting before and after that we were going to discuss here originally at the Frontline Club when we thought of this event. Uh, Stas was supposed to be in London in person talking about all of these things. But of course, our plans changed um, on the 24th of February. And now Stas is joining us from Ukraine. Um, and Stas, I'll begin with you, if that's okay. I'll, I would like to ask you my first question uh, before, before I move on to others. And that's um, essentially, where were you and how, how, you, what, how, how the full-scale invasion found you, essentially, on the 24th of February? You wrote that you were one of those people, in spite of your um, extremely difficult um, experience of uh, being captured and held captured in, in Donetsk. You were one of those people who, until the last day, did not believe that Russia was going to um, uh, stage this full-scale invasion. Tell us a little bit about that day. Uh, tell us a little bit about your thoughts about it. And also, if you don't mind sharing where you are at the moment, what, what, you know, what you're engaged in at the moment. Good evening, greetings from Kyiv. On the 24th of February, I was I, I met a small village on the other side of the town near Kyiv that's called Brovary. На той час я там знімав квартиру і їздив до Києва, оскільки тут лише 30 хвилин їзди на роботу. At the time, I was renting an apartment there, and I commuted to Kiev, which is only about half an hour away. At about half past four in the morning, I woke up because of some sounds that, that I described to myself as just that, noises. Але оскільки це був не Донецьк, не Маки, не Маківка, а Провари, то насправді у мене навіть у свідомості не було, що ці звуки треба поєднати з балістичними ракетами. But because I was no longer in Donetsk or in my in, in Makivka, but I was near Kiev and Brovary, it did not even occur to me to connect the noises to a concept of a um, of of a rocket of a rocket attack. Я вийшов на балкон, підійшов до вікна і ще хвилин 10 просто дивився в горизонт, прислуховувався і, власне, втратив дуже, дуже важливі, я б сказав, золоті 10 хвилин того часу. I went out on the balcony, I went to look out the window and went out on the balcony and stood there and watched the horizon for a while, for about 10 minutes. And uh, in this manner, I lost a very precious 10 minutes. Uh, вже наприкінці цих 10 хвилин я все ж таки відкрив мережу і зрозумів, що там вже люди писали про те, що йде обстріл не тільки Броварів, але й Києва, і власне ракети падають на військові частини. At the end of these 10 minutes I went back inside and opened uh, internet, check, check the internet where people were already reporting, writing that um, Russians were that, that there was shelling going on of Brovary and Kyiv and rockets were hitting military targets. Я одразу задзвонив своїй мамі, яка е, мешкала на той час у Києві, і сказав, що вона е, якнайшвидше збирала сумку, і я буду у неї протягом години, півтори, як тільки зможе дістатися. Immediately as quickly as possible, I called my mother, who was living in Kyiv at the time, and I told her to pack her go bag and uh, that I would come and uh, collect her within an hour or as soon as I can get there. Зі мною сталося те ж саме, що сталося вже на Донбасі, тобто життя протягом там 20-30 хвилин помістилось у дорожню сумку, і я одразу поїхав забирати з Києва маму. My experience was the same as it was for me in Donbass before my entire life was 
condensed into during 20 to 30 minutes into, into one bag, was packed down into one bag, and I went to pick up my mom. Коли я їхав до Києва, військова частина у Броварах була вже знищена, вона горіла, бо просто туди потрапила одна з ракет. While I was on my way to Kyiv, I saw that the military base in Brovary was already destroyed. It was on fire because it was it had been hit by a rocket directly. Але що цікаво, я заїхав по дорозі до мами ще до однієї важливої для мене людини і зрозумів, що у Києві здебільшого люди ще взагалі не зрозуміли, що почалась повномасштабна війна, багато з них просто спали. Uh, on my way to pick up my mom, I also stopped by to check on another person who is near and dear to me, and I realized that in Kiev, people still did not realize that it was a full that a full scale invasion has started, and they were still basically just asleep. Просто мало хто взагалі уявляв собі, що у Києві на Київ можуть падати балістичні ракети з Російської Федерації. Few people could imagine, could fathom that. Ballistic rockets from Russian Federation would fall on Kyiv. І в цей день я вивіз маму на Закарпаття. Наразі вона вже в Європі, і через день повернувся знову до Києва. So on that day, I took my mom out of Kyiv to Transcarpathia, and now she is in Europe. And the following day, I came back to Kyiv. And you're staying in Kyiv, um, and you obviously chose to stay in Kyiv, Stas. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit what your daily life is like right now? I mean, I've been in touch with you a little bit in preparation for this event. And uh, we exchanged a few messages when you said, look, I don't know what's going to happen in a couple of hours, not to mention a couple of weeks. What's, what's it like for you right now? Насправді, за цей місяць, який я перебуваю в Києві, не було жодного однакового дня у мене. It, truly, there was not one day was has been like another during this month that I have been in Kyiv. По-перше, дуже багато залежить від того, де саме територіально ви знаходитесь у Києві, в якому районі. So much depends on where physic where you are located physically within Kyiv, in which neighborhood, which district of it. Як всі ми розуміємо, найбільша загроза наразі з північного заходу та північного сходу для столиці. І наразі, наприклад, я знаходжусь саме от в цій частині, на північно-західній частині міста. As we all understand right now, the greatest threat to the city it comes from the northwest and northeast directions, and I'm actually right now in this north, northeast, northeast corner of the city. Тут постійні обстріли падають різного роду снаряди з боку Російської Федерації, як від реактивної артилерії, так і від тяжкої артилерії ствольної. The attacks are constant. We are constantly seeing various munitions, various um, shells fired at us, various missiles fired at us, both um, high-speed missiles and regular artillery, artillery um, Munitions. Але ну, я особисто, наприклад, для себе прийняв рішення принципово вже не спускатись ні в які бомбосховища чи метро, наприклад, з двох, мабуть, основних причин. I personally have made the decision not to go into a bomb shelter or a metro at all anymore for two reasons. Перша причина в тому, що повітряна сирена у Києві звучить протягом доби Ну, мабуть, до 15 разів, і тут або треба постійно знаходитись у підвалах, або просто вже не звертати на це увагу. The first reason is that the air raid sirens go off in Kyiv about 15 times a day, and so you either have to stay in the bomb shelter on the subway the entire time, or just not pay attention. Ну, і по-друге, знаєте, через деякі обставини моєї біографії, я не дуже то люблю такі приміщення підвальні з, зі скупченням людей. Я вже туди просто, хоча хлопці спускаються, так, але я з цього приводу дуже-дуже, м'яко кажучи, себе там некомфортно почуваю. And because of the certain circumstances of my background and what I had gone through, I do not feel particularly comfortable, and that's putting mildly in underground uh, spaces with great number of people in them. And so the guys go down, but I just, it, I just don't. Ну, якщо казати суто формально, то звичайно, що як тільки я повернувся до Києва, то я вступив до лав територіальної оборони. 
So just to just formally speaking, as soon as I came back to Kiev, I joined the Territorial Defense Forces. Thank you so much, Stas. I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions from the audience and we'll come back to you. But I'm just going to very quickly um, switch to our next guest, Natalia Humanyuk. Natalia, um, you've been covering this um, war right from the start. Um, in fact, you've been covering the Maidan protest before that and then the war immediately after. Um, and the question I'd like to ask you, what are, what are the challenges now and how are they different reporting covering the, the war and how are they different from what happened from, from the challenges that you had over the last eight years? In particular, I'm thinking about something you recently wrote. Um, I saw it on Twitter that you've spoken to yet another family from Mariupol who um, managed to escape the horrors um, that the city is engulfed in at the moment. And um, you are you seem to be anxious in that text that, you know, speaking about um, numerous deaths, the killing of civilians, um, the suffering that those civilians are going through um, is is difficult given how many people have gone through this already and and you seem to be anxious that you know people listening to these stories will think well I've already heard that story I don't need to hear another one and yet as you quite rightly pointed out every tra tragedy is unique and we need to not only tell it but we need to also hear it so I noticed that that might be one of the challenges of of talking about this phase of the full-scale invasion uh, of Ukraine by uh, Putin's Russia. But maybe you could elaborate on some other challenges that you see in now. Um, hi, hello, everybody. I think I probably would sound weird and bizarre to quite a few people to say that now it's easier. I mean, this war, it's easier to cover. I mean, we even found the description that this is a war and that was kind of the Donetsk war. It's not really true, but that's how we, while interviewing the people, we're saying like that war, this war. Especially now I'm in Zaporizhia, I've been to Dnipro, the area in proximity to both Crimea and to uh, the Donbas. Um, I would come back to what um, you said, Alessia, but um, probably the difference is, and I want to place it very clearly, I did covered the conflict, the war in Crimea, the occupation in the Donbas for eight years. Quite, you know, like not, not everybody did that, not every journalist, not now every journalist is doing this job. Uh, there was a part of the political process there and I was really on the side of the dialogue, humanitarian situation and the others. And still, despite what, you know, not despite, but to saying that, you know, stars experience horrible ways and we know who is, to, you know, like who is to blame for uh, the war in 2014. It was Russia which occupied Crimea. It became more obvious for the world, but still there was some kind of place for the discussion, you know, uh, of vulnerability, political vulnerabilities, uh, how the humans uh, were used in that war. Um, and uh, now it's, so it was more complex from the point of view of politics. We needed to kind of understand the context of Crimea or the Donbas. This war is practically very black and wild. It's very old fashioned kinetic military war, which is not really about any political process, any nuances, it's super simple. It's really a heavy weapon is killing people and there is a very simple way to stop it using the, uh, you know, like the military, the army and uh, the weapon which is capable to defend people and defend towns from the, um, from the uh, um, uh, really being killed. Um, so, uh, but the difference is that, of course, the biggest challenge for us is the scale and uh, the scale and the time. I, I think uh, people still globally do not understand how large is Ukraine and the things are happening all over the place. And even that we have a big country, uh, often reaching out the place, we find out that there are little amount of the journalists being there. We often coming to be one of the first. I know there are a lot of journalists in Lviv, in Kiev, sometimes in Odessa, but really like being today in the area of Zaporizhia and even greeting the people from Mariupol as I did with my colleagues within the last couple of days. Uh, it's not really, you know, like we are lacking people telling this story. And my fear is indeed uh, it's not really just that, you know, stories were, won't be heard, that people would be get used to this war. 
Uh, I also think because I covered the different wars uh, prior to Ukraine, Russian Ukrainian war globally, I think with the, the time is developing so fast and the information span became so short that even that tragedies as like in Mariupol, which is something, you know, like there were cases in European history in the Balkans, we know about the siege of Sarajevo, you know, we, we shouldn't just compare the these events to the Second World War, but they are developing that fast that even after, you know, like two, three weeks, uh, people getting tired of listening to that story. So for instance, challenge of Mariupol is we have the city where there were half a million people living. We have maybe, you know, up to 300,000 people being there even more when the severe attacks and bombardment started. So the amount of the people who are affected, it's so enormous that there is no way to comprehend it. But because the story had been already told, it had been already on the cover of magazine A and magazine B, and the dramatic, the, the, the bomb on the uh, dr uh, drama theater in Mariupol just was so horrendous because there was a sign, children, you know, around this uh, location, that any other story isn't really that strong. And we kind of thinking that like we can tell, you know, do two reports about that, three reports, and the scale is might be 300 southern people. I'm not telling about the people who passed away. We still do not know the figure, but I'm telling about the people affected. And my biggest concern is that the time is developing that fast with the internet, with 24 seven news. Uh, it feels like already now the, the journalist or the world would be ready just already for another atrocity in the very short time span. Should we already think that now, okay, after Mariupol, the bad thing would be the chemical attack, you know, so anything but it won't be that bad, so we won't cover it. Uh, and I think we're getting adjusted. I, mean, I think that people are getting adjusted to the different wars and atrocities, but these are developing that fast and the scale is that big that we're getting too fast to the horrendous things. And even a small town which had been bombed and the people hadn't reached yet and its story hadn't been told has no chances to be you know, covered today. Like finalized, I've been to the village near today in, in near the Parisia, which compared to anything, and that's what I thought. There were just a couple of buildings destroyed. There were a grand lady, a grand uh, elderly lady, you know, uh, damaged. The but it's already nothing, you know. Like in, in our kind of after a month of the war, it's already something which nobody would care because it's normal. So my concern is having this war normalized. And I'm speaking not just as a Ukrainian citizen. I'm speaking really as a foreign reporter who looking how the wars were developing, you know, early and how we looking at this war. It has a, a huge support from the globe, but I'm already concerned that people are kind of trying to discuss that, you know, like people are already tired after one month to comprehend it and to, you know, follow for it. Natalia, thank you so much. You raised so many important questions there, and I do actually want to follow up on, on some of those, especially sort of getting tired of this war. Already. I mean, as a historian, to be honest, I've been thinking, what we've been complaining about the world not speaking about the last eight years of the war that started in 2014. And it feels to me now there's no chance of ever speaking about that war in any nuanced way because we've got you know now a month and whatever's going to come after that you know which is the scale is so much larger so so i i can relate to that in that way as well um isabel i'd like to move on to you now but i really want people here in in the room who are at the back no, don't, no not taking your questions yet but you're standing and there are some chairs at the front so please come and make yourself comfortable and sit at the front if you feel comfortable doing that so you don't have to stand at the back so this is your chance to you know to move up and sit down if you want to. If you're comfortable standing, that's fine. Um, yes, yes, some are coming, great. Um, Isabel, so you arrived in Kyiv, I saw you in London um, in December, I think, right? Before you went to Kyiv, very briefly. And and you arrived in Kyiv at the same time as a, as a small army of foreign reporters, right? There's, there, were, there were quite a lot of uh, 
journalists from all over the world coming to Kiev, and we sort of even joked over email saying, what the hell are they doing here? They're just all sitting bored in restaurants and cafes exploring Ukraine. And of course, then, you know, then they became very busy. Um, so I would like to ask you to share some of your observations of this world attention, media attention on Ukraine right now, something that didn't happen in 2014, something that didn't really happen since 2014 until a month ago, well, a couple of months ago when Russian troops started to amass around the Ukrainian border, but also to maybe follow up on what Natalia's already started to talk about, this sort of Ukraine fatigue or war fatigue, if you wish. I mean, it's not just Ukraine fatigue, it's sort of wider problem than that. How do we avoid it? How do we um, keep our attention uh, on this um, situation in Ukraine? I mean, one of the ways when, when journalists ask me what uh, what uh, we can do, I suggest that you know we need to remember that it affects us here. It affects everybody, not just people in Ukraine. It affects the entire Europe and indeed the world. Um, but maybe you have other suggestions and observations you'd like to share. I'm sure, yeah. So I, I think I really agree with what Natalia has said about how black and white this current conflict is um, compared to the one that started in 2014, where there was the sort of Russian propaganda had made a lot of room for kind of people to be confused, let's say, about who was really behind the war. Um, and I think, you know, Natalia is also right in saying that, you know, there was specific context of the of Crimea and the Donbass, but but even so, it was it was a manufactured war. Um, whereas the, what I see now with foreign journalists coming to Ukraine, um, their reporting on it is actually, it, 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 like Natalia said, it's much easier for them to report on it because it is so black and white. And and I I've, I've found in general, and I I haven't had time to read everyone's coverage, but I found in general that people's coverage has been pretty accurate. Um, uh, and yeah, again, like the the scale of of foreign journalists here is 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 quite crazy. Um, and I think one thing that this that the reporting is currently lacking is more Ukrainian journalists. Um, so a lot of Ukrainian journalists are like, well, they were the first of all they weren't war reporters uh, like Natalia, or like others who worked at Hromadsky or Stas or wh whoever. Um, they were just normal journalists um, who then found themselves in the middle of one of the biggest conflicts you know the modern world has ever seen basically um and you know there's just stuff like training uh ppe uh first aid all of these things that you know the like a group of ukrainian journalists are already working towards uh sort of solving some resolving some of these issues but even so i think it's been like a massive shock for a lot of ukrainian journalists and not only are they trying to report on what's happening but they're also like experience immense stress um, because of their family members and their friends and trying to you know manage all these different moving bits all together and I think I can't even imagine what it's like for them um, so I think that the, the, the foreign journalists have uh, in some areas particularly in the in the more hot areas dominated um, perhaps more um, and I mean I'd, I'd be open to definitely hearing other people's views on whether they think this this has meant that like some you know depth has been lacking I, I'm not I again I haven't had time to sort of uh look at everybody's coverage but um but yeah I would I would definitely say that uh their reporting has been more accurate and they've also sort of looked at the I had I would say they have looked at the 2014 conflict a lot of people who are who are brand new to Ukraine let's say and tried to sort of they've been asking me questions I don't know whether other people have received uh, similar things and 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 there's definitely a more of a kind of open-minded approach um, whereas I think in the past because Ukraine was traditionally covered from Moscow um, by the by the major foreign uh, bureaus I think in the past like a lot of a lot of that kind of uh, chauvinism as it were like kind of seeped through um, and I don't see that happening uh, now. Um, Alessa, could you, what was your second question, sorry? I, I think you sort of, I mean, the second question was about Ukraine fatigue, how do we avoid it? Or war fatigue, how do we avoid it? If you um, want to share some of the observations. I think that's a really interesting question and I find that really difficult. I, so I just come out just yesterday for, for a week's break. So I find, so I haven't really been able to look at it from afar, so I mean, for me, certainly, I, I don't have that fatigue, um, but I, I but I would say that um, 
I would still say that, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, 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 it's one of the biggest events. It's the biggest story in the world right now. It's one of the biggest events that's happened in Europe in a very, very long time. Um, and I think Natalia is right in, in terms of, you know, because everything went unlike a kind of uh, other wars that we've seen, uh, where things kind of gradually build, you know, there's like in Syria, there were these, you know, uprisings and then they were crushed and then they got bigger and then, and then things expanded and escalated. Whereas in this, it went from zero to a hundred in one day and stayed that way for one well, out a month. Um, so I think there, there is that risk of people just being overwhelmed by the intensity of the conflict and the atrocities and sort of wanting the coverage to match that constantly. But I think um, every, every like a lot of journalists, uh, Natalia Olga included, have done a lot of work around trying to sort of bring those human aspects to people and trying to make people in the rest of the world relate to uh, Ukrainians. Um, so I so I so I, th I think that's that's like you know I think that's that's what kind of our job is is to find ways to make sure that people are kind of still engaging with the with the conflict and not uh just you know turning off because like Natalia said you know okay it wasn't 300 people today who died and this like you know blatant uh atrocity is a war crime rather um so yeah I I that that's what I would say Thank you, Isabel. I'm sure we'll come back to you. Olya, um, this is to follow up on the discussion that we're already having, and it's a sort of change in narrative if there is any. I mean, what Isabel said that, you know, when Ukraine is not being covered from Moscow bureaus anymore, there are people on the ground. Um, and there's a lot of will, I think, to report in a nuanced way. Still, my personal observation is that we are still stuck in the framework um, that is being dictated uh, from Moscow. Moscow and indeed has been dictated by the Kremlin. For instance, we're still being asked, well, what is the difference between Ukrainians and Russians? For, um, what is Putin trying to achieve? Um, uh, does he have legitimate security concerns and so on? Um, and there's still, so Ukraine still, I think, in Ukrainian voices still lack agency in the reporting on Ukraine. Do you agree with that observation? And if so, how how do you see we can change that? How, how do you think we can um, alter it? Uh, thank you, Olesa, and uh, great respect for my colleagues who were speaking earlier for those who are visiting the front line, I'm safely here in Western Ukraine, uh, telling about what's happening here and also observing from a safe distance uh, what is happening. So I greatly appreciate those who are taking risks to cover from the hotspots. Uh, you know, I, I partly agree with what you're saying, uh, with what you said, with your argument, but just partly because I think uh, what has changed this time is that, um, uh, you know, uh, while, uh, as Isabel said, it went from zero to 100, well, it was not completely surprising. It was not like a total surprise, this war, right? Because there were news coming in for several months about Russian military buildup and, uh, and the Americans especially were very vo vocal in warning that Russia is about to launch an invasion of Ukraine. And kind of, Thanks to that, if, if I may put it like this, um, a lot of attention was focused on Ukraine even before the invasion. And we've, we've had a lot of foreign crews and international journalists coming to Ukraine in the months leading up to the invasion and covering you know, the situation and what was happening. And what I found in conversations with these journalists is that, um, well, some of them were already have already been to Ukraine and they had some knowledge of Ukraine, but some of them, were new and you know they were discovering Ukraine and I think it's good that they arrived before actually the invasion started so you know some of them returned later or their colleagues from their media they they returned when the invasion began uh, but I think in a way like it was a good thing that the, this presence of international journalists was there several weeks and months before the full-scale invasion started because Already, the public in, in in other countries internationally was getting, you know, information from inside Ukraine, and also a lot of myths that were circulating in the information space since 2014, myths propelled by Russian propaganda, 
about, uh, I don't know, like uh, a province of far right in Ukraine or about the, you know, a crackdown on uh, free speech because some pro-Russian TV stations were closed mm -hmm. uh, or uh, that, uh, uh, you know, Ukraine is a very like corrupt, failed state. Uh, all, all these Russian propaganda narratives, uh, a, a part of them was already debunked in, in the months and in the weeks before the invasion by all these journalists who were coming before the invasion and asking me this sort of things, you know, and I was like explaining to them, well, and, and they actually were saying, well, we didn't expect Ukraine to be like this. We had a different idea of Ukraine based on what we read in the media, what was reported in this in this period, because actually there was a lull, there was like you know a void in reporting on Ukraine between uh, 2014 and late 2021, early 2022, because there was a peak of interest to Ukraine, of course, when Crimea was annexed, when Russia launched the the first invasion in Donbas, and then the attention was slowly fading away. And in the meanwhile, in these eight years, Ukraine really has changed. You know, it has undergone a, a remarkable transformation on so many levels, and in terms of democratic development, in terms of uh, the strengthening of civil society of the of its institutions. It had several free and fair elections. Uh, it, you know, um, the important reforms were introduced: uh, uh, anti-corruption reforms and reforms ensuring greater transparency uh, in different levels, uh, you know, the, the digitalization of the economy, the uh, prominence of the IT sector in the economy, all these things uh, that happened over this eight year period between 2014 and 2022, but they were not consistently reported by many media, right? Like some, some international media have had the presence in Kyiv, but they reported it, but we can count them probably on you know fingers of one hand. So th there was like this kind of misunderstanding of what Ukraine is and what country Ukraine is, and and a lot of uh, reporting and the understanding of Ukraine, even on behalf of you know the journalists themselves, but who have not been to Ukraine before, who just read you know what what they could find in in the open sources, was was not really corresponding to what the reality on the ground were. And I think it's it's good that, you know, in the in the months leading up to the invasion, th there were more reports about Ukraine portraying the country as it was in 2021, in 2022, and how it also changed and how it was transformed over, over this uh, eight year period. Still, however, for many in, in the media and of course the general public across the globe, was a huge surprise that Ukraine has managed to, you know, put up such a remarkable resistance to Russian invasion. Uh, a, a lot of people were surprised by that. I'm still getting, you know, questions from the media, but like, how come was the secret? And where where I surprised? And I respond like, I no, I wasn't surprised because I live here. I know these people. You know, I I know what they are capable of, and like. It's, I speak to many people and it was I wasn't surprised I expected that but many people were surprised and I think the surprise it also stems from this kind of misunderstanding of Ukraine and underestimation actually of what Ukrainians are capable of of how strong they are how determined they are and how important actually the country is to them you know how how important the democracy in Ukraine is for them how important the human rights uh, freedom uh, you know, strong civil society is for them. No, and absolutely. Yeah, Ola, thank you. And also the, the fact that, you know, we have lived through a war for eight years and we know what Crimea is like and we know what Donbass, occupied Donbass is like. And so we know what occupation means. And for that reason, exactly. you know, for that reason, we are prepared to fight to make sure that it doesn't happen elsewhere in Ukraine. Um, Ola, we'll come back to, to you, of course, as well. Um, I just wanted to point out, you, know, you said that you're, you're, you're speaking from relative safety or from safety, I think you even put it. But actually, before we began, you told us that you're in a bomb shelter. Yeah, well, the safety is relative in Ukraine, and uh, there was a siren just before the, uh, you know, we were about to go live. So yeah, I'm in, I'm in a basement, <laughs> but now I'm, I'm alone. All the other people left because the siren was called off. So. Uh, I just thought I'd point it out because I think we are in safety and that's something we need to appreciate and remember and be really grateful to all of you for joining us from relative safety indeed. And on that note, I really want to open the floor to questions. Um, we'll begin with the audience here present in London and then we'll switch to the questions on Zoom. So I'll collect, um, I think I'll collect 
three questions, clusters. Please introduce yourselves, wait for the mic first, and then say who the question is for if it's for someone specific. So lady at the back, let's begin with you. So hi, um, my name is Nick Keeney. I actually work at Twitter at the moment, but I previously worked in war and terrorism at Sky News. I've covered the Middle East. I covered Mariupol last time. On the questions that you asked, what I found super interesting are two things. The fatigue. We came out of Afghanistan. We went straight almost into Ukraine. And I remember covering it last time. And I remember being told everyone needs to go home. But it hadn't finished. And the reason it had to go home is because nobody gave a fuck anymore. The audience ratings went down. Nobody gave a shit. And that frightens the shit out of me because these are people's lives. The second thing is I work in a lot in misinformation now, right? Like. And I think that's also problematic is because even if you take really basic things, we're all very intelligent people and we have influence. If you take even, for example, the. Oh, the mic is down. Just a second. Uh, no, but they won't be able okay. to hear you. So, so the maternity ward, like you see pregnant women come covered with blood. Uh, just a second. Nina, can we get a different mic or maybe a, a different battery? Does that. So basically the maternity, I'll speak slower, the maternity ward. You know, those images are indisputably what is going on, and yet the propaganda coming out was such that people questioned it. Also, Russia are now locking Facebook, Twitter, all of those things in those countries. To, so my question is, what do we do about the fatigue? And by, by totally honestly, what I mean by fatigue is having worked at Sky News, having been in dangerous fucking places and being told to come home because no one gave a fuck anymore. How do we deal with that? And the second question is, how do we deal with misinformation? My job now is to deal with exactly this, which is why I'm here. But you know what? There's a lot of people in this room that have a lot of influence, and we need to do more. I'm sorry, I'm really foul mouthed, so fine, or whatever it is, what it is. But like, I don't know who that question is to, but I don't know what the answer is either. Great, thank you. Let's take another two questions. So, gentleman there um, with the hand up, and lady here, and then we'll get the answers and come back to you. Yeah. Um... Thank you all very much. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I've, um, I'm a former law enforcement intelligence analyst who's worked in Kiev immediately after the um, Orange Revolution and also just before and after the Maidan. That was for European Union programs. I am not an admirer of the European Union and how it betrayed Ukraine. My question for you all is, what questions would you like people in the audience to ask of Russians living in the UK in order to avoid the war fatigue, which you've referred to, several of you have referred to, and to counter Russian disinformation. If anybody in the room, and I know there will be quite a few, looks at the European Commission through rose-tinted spectacles in relation to Russia and Ukraine, please take the spectacles off and start supporting Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And one more question here, and we'll go over to our speakers. So, thank you. Hi, my name is Charlotte Eager, and I am a former foreign correspondent. In fact, I was the Daily Mail's correspondent in Kiev um, 30 years ago when it first went independent um, before going to Bosnia. So um, my question is quite nerdy, actually, which is that um, Given that the Russians have announced today that they're going to stop trying to attack Kiev and concentrate their forces in the east, um, if we believe them, and I think actually it's probably quite a sensible idea on Kremlin's part, does that not mean that they're just freeing their army up to attack other strategic goals they have, concentrate their forces on, for example, Odessa, um, you know, wipe out Mariupol, get that sickle of land that they want, and possibly connect up with Transnistria? And I don't know who this is aimed at, but I do know that that would cripple Ukraine's trade. Thank you. So I'll just very quickly reiterate uh, the questions that have been asked. So again, talking about Ukraine fatigue and how to fight misinformation. The second question was about what questions you'd like us here in the UK to ask of Russians, I assume living in the UK. 
Yeah, um, great variety of Russians, I think, live in the UK. Um, maybe we could specify uh, <laughs> what kind of Russians. Uh, and also Russian declarations versus Russian actions. So declarations that they will move away from focusing on Kyiv, but does that mean that they will actually attack elsewhere? Who would like to take any of those? Please just just begin. <laughs> I have no other way. Or maybe put your hand up. I can see you on the screen. Who would like to start? Uh, I'll start, but I won't answer all, so leave it no. to yeah. my colleagues. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm kind of cautious. I raised the, this question about the fatigue, which I'm concerned. I, I rather think like that I even don't know how to tell the story, especially about this very, you know, how fast things are developing. You know, Afghanistan was there for decades, but like Ukraine could, you know, like the, the I really agree with what Isabel said, that it was like very intense and it remains intense. Uh, but the expectation is something worse should be happen, something even worse should happen, but it's really uh, pretty dreadful. Um, I think what is very interesting and how I find it, I, I to be honest, like I, I don't want to take too much time, but that's what I was thinking today. I really was, you know, one of the, you know, like there were reporters who started to, re to report on the civilian damage in the 2014. And exactly after a month, I thought like, I'm so kind of so difficult to cover those houses shelled, another house, another house, another house. And now for me, I have these flashbacks going to the city so that those towns, you know, or the village, those people haven't, haven't seen that, but I have seen that. I had my fatigue to be honest, I should admit. But I find my way because I'm kind of so inspired by the people, I think that the, this, let's say compassion and empathy, it also has the limits to in, in, in the global world, you know, like people after Syria, after everything, people sometimes feel powerless. And it's also very sad. What Ukraine gives, I think any war, but Ukraine specifically also to me, it's such also an inspiration for an incredible things which unusually people doing. I see so many communities doing something which I couldn't imagine. You know, like uh, we, we speak about the volunteers and the others, but on the local level, you know, the people in the villages, the people in the, you know, youngsters, the guys from the suburbs who are usual teenagers and who you don't want to consider the ones who would be heroic, but they have this incredible pure mindset of, you know, very democratic people, you know, like you, whether you meet an, elderly guy in a village A, or there would be a guy from a suburb somewhere in Kharkiv, like a really suburban neighborhood. And they would speak about the, you know, human life. They wouldn't speak about human rights. They would speak about, uh, you know, human life. They would speak about the rules. They would speak about humanity. They would speak about the right to choose. They would speak about the, you know, all those things which actually are meant democracy, a meant rule of war, war, the civilization, but which later was kind of, there was this used diplomatic and journalistic double speak with the terms human rights, you know, like all this rule of law, which for a lot of people, people don't com comprehend. So I do think there is something very, I, 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 it's not the competition of the victimhood. I don't want to say that Ukrainian war is worse, but really this element of the fight for kind of civilized world with the rules it's there. This story isn't really, that it, it's partially present, but inspiration of all those things could be the answer to this fatigue, because it's really some a fatigue, not from Ukraine, but from the way how we cover the conflict with the victims, you know, like to find like a different challenge, not to go to cliche all the time. Don't forget about humanitarian stories, but to not to go to this cliche. I shortly would speak about the uh, misinformation, everything. I leave to the clicks, but about this circle, because I've been in Odessa and Mariupol, I'm going to the Donbass. We are really concerned that really the forces would be regrouping and there would be uh, really fierce fights in the Donbass. We do not really fully trust that it won't be in Kiev or elsewhere. Some things might happen uh, still. Uh, I do think there would be po possible attempt on, on really cutting out the Ukrainian south and the fights would be still there. But concern is that if the war would move to the Donbas and also 
early and non-occupied Donbas, it would have less interest because Kiev is Kiev, Lviv is Lviv, but Donbas would look like, oh, this is another, the war we, 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 used, we used to have, so you know it's not that exciting. However, we're speaking about a different level of atrocities as in Mariupol, it's by the way, the Donbas, the different level of the, you know, like, and another, and in particular, we're speaking about the population of a numbers of millions, which is at risk of the repressions, because they were here for eight years, active participants, active citizens of Ukraine, and we already see them in occupied towns. Uh, those people are, you know, uh, abducted. They are there are searches for them. So it won't be like even if the Donbas, the another part of the Donbas would be occupied, it would be not exactly as it was within the eight year, years. It would be something different, maybe in in way more repressive way. Thank you, Natalia. Any anybody else uh, would like to tackle some? Isabel, please. Uh, I think you might be muted. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to Natalia's point about inspiration. Uh, so we were in Kharkiv last week um, and the shelling was really serious. Um, there was sort of ingoing and outgoing constantly, but I'd say like incoming maybe like a few times an hour even, um, <clears throat> and a few times like quite close to us. Um, but even so, the municipal workers, so these people who collect the rubbish, people who are sweeping the street, people who are tending to the park gardens, um, were just completely like, you know, they're so proud of their city. It's a Russian speaking city, but it's got, you know, a pretty much Ukrainian identity now. Um, and yeah, I just, everybody was so sort of determined to protect the city, to do whatever they could within their own power um, to help things and to make it look uh, nice again. Like Kharkiv is known for being this like clean city in Ukraine um, and, and they don't want to let that slide, even though, even 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 though they're being attacked almost constantly. Like the rubbish workers, uh, the rubbish collectors. Sorry, um, they go to around ninety percent of the city. So anywhere they can get physically, like they can physically access. So even the parts in the north and the the east where the shelling is really heavy, and you know you're right up close to Russian lines. Um, they're still going there and collecting rubbish, and people are so grateful that they come out and help them help them put the rubbish in the truck you know it's like it's it's something that I I I, I maybe because I'm British and I, I'm not like I'm only half Ukrainian but it's like I just I, I'm shocked by how um how people are continuing and 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 even though these are people who are not military but they're they're trying to to sort of resist in their own way and um I do think that is 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 very inspiring so yeah Great, thank you. Stas, can I ask you to maybe comment on the question what we should be asking uh, Russians here in London? Or maybe telling them? Uh, I think you might be muted as well. It has to happen at least once, right? <laughs> That's, I don't think we can hear you. We can't hear you. Ми вас не чуємо, якщо Sorry. Ah, не чуємо, чуємо. Так, я кажу, що я боюсь, що я тут не можу бути стороннім споглядачем, тому що мені, власне, з росіянами нема про що говорити. Um, I'm afraid I cannot be an impartial observer here or impartial commentator because I have nothing uh, to talk about with the Russians. Єдиний росіянин, з яким я наразі спілкуюсь, це Олександр Невзоров. Він десь там у Швейцарії з температурою валяється. І я думаю, що це єдине моє коло, яким я обмежусь наразі. The only Russian that I talked to is Alexander Nevzorov, who is uh, flat on his back somewhere in Switzerland with a high fever. And I think I'll stick, I'll keep my tight circle of Russians to that. Але що цікаво, ви знаєте, наприклад, якщо казати знову ж таки про Невзорова, у нього його ролики збирають десь 2-2,5 мільйони просмотрів, і це дуже багато саме росіян його дивляться. But what's interesting is if you know this about Невзоров, his videos attract two to two to two and a half million views each time, and a lot of those views are Russians who live in Russia. І тут, звичайно, у мене виникає ну, таке, скоріш, риторичне, риторичне запитання до росіян, а якщо все ж таки така велика частка людей, які е, мають ну, щонайменше ліберальні погляди, то що вони всі роблять зараз у Росії? Вони просто сидять і мовчать? 
So, so this this prompts a question for me that uh, basically is if, if there are so many people in Russia with at least somewhat liberal views then who watch these videos, then what are they all doing in Russia at the moment? Are they just sitting still and being silent? Well, that's a question rhetoric. But that is a rhetorical question. <laughs> Дякую, Стаса. Do, do you want to ви хочете прокоментувати якісь з інших запитань? While we have you, поки ви з нами. Do you want to comment on other questions? Uh, я, ну, я, мабуть, можу сказати трішечки про дезінформацію, тому що uh, все ж таки, як людина, яка вісім uh, років займається професійно цією темою, я розумію, що uh, люди підходять до інформації вже з певним набором власних переконань. So I could comment a little bit on this information as somebody who has spent eight years of his life working on the topic professionally and the thing i would like to say one thing i observed is that people come to information already with a set of preconceived ideas і тому якщо ви людина яка географічно і ментально дуже далека від цього конфлікту і від України ви не зможете отак на скидку що як то кажуть одразу зрозуміти чи Фейк перед вами, чи це справжня історія, яка є результатом там журналістського розслідування? So if you are a person who is geographically remote from Ukraine, you it is it is challenging for you. It would be challenging for you to understand if you're new to the topic, sort of at the drop of a hat, whether a story is a fake or is a product of genuine journalistic inquiry. Чому через власні стереотипи, з якими ви підходите до інформації? And the reason for this, why this happens, is because you have your own stereotypes which you bring to information that you consume. Наприклад, два дні тому росіяни зняли ролик про те, як здався цілий український штаб, 61 людина під Миколаївкою під Києвом. So, for example, a few days ago, Russians made a video about an entire Ukrainian field headquarters, 61 persons, turning themselves into the Russian forces at Mykolaivka near Kyiv. Я як людина, яка має звичайно про українську позицію, розуміє, що відбувається на фронті, зокрема навколо Миколаївки, подивився це відео саме з точки зору от таких своїх переконань. I am a person who is in Ukraine and understands what's going on in Ukraine. And so I watched this video based um, and, and I understand what's going on around Mykolaiv. So I watched this video armed with these, um, with these views and convictions that I have. Я одразу побачив два моменти. Перше, жоден з цих людей не промовив жодного слова. Їх просто зібрали у чергу, але жоден з них нічого не сказав. And I noticed two things. First is none of the people in the video spoke a single word. They were lined up into a queue, but none of them said a single word. Чому? Тому що жоден з них не має розуміння, що таке українська мова. Why is that? Because none of them have any concept of what Ukrainian language is. І друге, ці, вибачте, ідіоти, їм пов'язали просто жовті пов'язки, хоча ми вже три тижні ходимо з синім. And the second thing is that the idiots who are making the video uh, put uh, yellow armbands on them, even though the Ukrainian army has been wearing blue ones for three weeks. Але для людей, які це дивляться у Донецьку, а саме від них я і дізнався, що ми програємо і в Миколаївці всі здались, це виглядає як абсолютно реальна картинка, тому що вони не бачать цих нюансів, з якими підійшов я до відео. But for people who are watching this, from the occupied Donetsk. Everything looks different because they do not have this background information that I have to distinguish these nuances. And it's the people from Donetsk who told me that the Ukrainians are losing the war and are losing around Mykolaivka and the entire Mykolaivka HQ just turned itself in. Тому це дуже складне питання, яке безумовно включає ваш культурний досвід і в тому числі ідеологічний. So this is a very complex question that includes that includes considerations of your cultural experience, your cultural background, as well as your as an individual's ideological background. Дякую, Стаса. Thank you so much. And I know that Оля also wants to comment on disinformation. Оля, 
Yeah, I just wanted to add a few words because I reported on this story about a bombing uh, of a hospital, of a maternity hospital in Mariupol. And I was actually a person uh, who I think first like announced that this woman, the pregnant woman, one of them who was pictured, she gave birth to a baby two days after the bombing because I, I was reached by her relatives like who contacted me and we were in touch since the day of the bombing. And we spoke like every day and we are still in touch and like, exchanging news and unfortunately there are no news in the recent days about uh, the whereabouts of the of this woman Mariana uh, who was pictured and who was who later gave birth and and you know uh, it is really remarkable like how how Russian officials actually it's not just uh, propaganda online uh, by some like trolls or suspicious accounts or by Russian state media those were uh, Russian officials, actually, Russian official accounts on Twitter of Russian embassies in different countries that were peddling this uh, story that this woman was a crisis actor, that she was wearing makeup, that she wasn't pregnant, in fact. And, and you know, like when I when I spoke to her relatives, I, I had to ask like for her photos so they can like confirm that they are indeed relatives uh, and, you know, uh, that she was indeed pregnant. And like I asked them like also like personal questions because the propaganda was already there and it was get, getting so much traction that you know you have to ask like this even like silly things in order to be able to to debunk it and uh, well I, I i very much hope that uh, this woman mariana she's safe now uh, i don't know like where she is and like my last information from her relatives was that she might have crossed the border to russia because as you know that some and thousands of actually residents of Mariupol have been taken to Russia very often against their own will. They were deported forcibly to, to Russia across the border. So she might be one of them. And I, I really very much hope that, you know, she will not be, if she if she is indeed Russian, that she will not be abused again by, by Russian propaganda. Uh, and, 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 you know, and ask the, on the question, like, what can we as journalists do to address, uh, you know, this issue? And how, how can we fight this propaganda and disinformation? Uh, you know, I, I think we uh, we still report on the premise that um, there are like two, at least like two opinions that we have to represent and they these opinions are somehow equal, but it is very often not the case. Uh, and very often, you know, when even Russian officials say something, they are just lying. And, and in many cases, we actually know that they are lying. Still, we report them very often like the media report these lies very often as if they were as valid you know as as the facts and as as truth and it's a huge challenge actually for, for journalists uh, the disinformation and especially state propaganda like how do you report on you know what the other side is saying when you know that they are lying you still have to somehow report on it but also to make your audience understand that this most probably like is a lie or 100% is a lie. So not all uh, this like both sideism sometimes is is what is failing us. You know, the, the, our habit and our like adherence to journalistic standards uh, that we are used to uh, it sometimes doesn't work and um, works against the, the interest of the audience in cases where when one side or the facts on the ground, or the journalists who were there, who took the photos of this woman that she was pregnant, and who two days later took the photos of her newborn baby. Well, these are the facts, and these are the images coming from there. And then there is the other side who is saying, well, she is just an actor, and she never gave birth, and she was never pregnant. How do we put a distinction that these two opinions do not have equal value? You know, I think that's a challenge for journalism, and something that the media are still kind of trying to answer and to uh, come up with a, a, a you know a, a set of uh, a rules how to approach the information and reporting in this new era where this information is so pervasive and coming from state actors 
Thank you, Ole, and I guess that speaks to the, the importance of having so many journalists and international journalists on the ground as well, who can actually witness what is happening and report on, on, on what they're witnessing. Let's take some more questions here. Oh, lots and lots of questions. My goodness, we might not have time for all of these, I'm afraid. So, so I notice you first, and then you, and then the lady next, and then we'll see how many more we can cover. <clears throat> Uh, hi, Casper Bullock, um, just a regular attendee at the Frontline Club. Um, it may be a premature question given the intensity of ongoing fighting, but I'm wondering in your ongoing reporting and engagement with sections of society in Ukraine, what are the opinions um, towards potential negotiation stances uh, that the um, that the Ukrainian negotiators may take towards their Russian counterparts, and what are the opinions that you you observe uh, in in large sections of uh, um, you know quote unquote normal Ukrainian people who aren't the negotiators in the room, and are they similar to to what you hear from Zelensky, or are they different? And what what are some of your observations about that? Great, thank you. Um, there was a question just there, sir. Yeah, um, no, over there. Yeah. I'm Daniel Jania, I work for a um, Stanford Research Institute spin-off. Um, my question is, what what's your message to people like John Mersheimer in, in the US and even Noam Chomsky and to some degree uh, Martin Wolf in, in London, people who are renowned academics who are putting all the blame on the US and, and the NATO expansion, um, especially in 2008. Uh, what was done by George Bush and um, to what degree that's distracting um, that whole narrative put forward by these academics. Thank you. Uh, lady there, in red top. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Tatiana Nesterchuk. Yeah, um, I'm a Ukrainian barrister uh, practicing here in London and also a refugee from Donetsk. Um, my question... <laughs> Exactly. Um, my question really is um, about the stories. I think one of the most important stories that could come out of this war is a story about our language. Um, the fact that we, especially um, Ukrainians from Eastern Ukraine, are dual speaking nationals. We are dual language people, and especially people of my generation born in the USSR. Um, and um, uh, I'd like uh, more people to recognize that the fact that I speak Russian um, does not mean that I am less Ukrainian uh, than somebody who um, only speaks Ukrainian. Um, and, that, and also that Ukrainian is not a dialect of Russian. A lot of people, when I first came to England, kept asking me, oh, you don't really speak two languages, you just, because Ukrainian is just a dialect. <laughs> so I hope that this is something that um, can be debunked, but I'd love to hear from you what sort of stories you think are really important to tell now, you know, being reporters there in Ukraine. Excellent. I think we will have another, thank you. We'll have another round of questions where we'll have time, but I will ask you to be brief. I'll just quickly remind you. So the question, the first one was about negotiations. Do they, you know, how do people perceive these negotiations on the ground, sort of ordinary Ukrainians? Um, and also there was a question in chat, which you might have already seen, which is sort of potentially related to that. Uh, and that's how effective has President Zelensky's handling of the media has been? So how are people in Ukraine perceiving his messages? Um, I mean, it's difficult to generalize, I think, but maybe you could comment on that. And then we had a question, what do we, what is your message to people who keep focusing their attention, especially in the academic world on NATO expansionism and criticism? of the states um, and finally an excellent question what are the stories we should be that should be coming out of Ukraine such as for instance recognition of Ukraine as a bilingual and in fact multilingual country um, lots of questions there try and be brief if you can so we can collect more questions who would like to start I ask the question I talked to the people on the ground on the negotiations but there was very little time you know because it was a very short news um, I think first, uh, I do not think that it's still real. That would be really something which is, it's like suggestion from Ukraine, uh, uh, but I'm not very much sure that Russia would really, is, is still willing to engage, but it was important that Ukraine uh, put it. Um, you know, I mean, people, um, 
how to say it, um, I want to put it very clear. Uh, there was very limited amount of time I could ask, and people have very different views. It's Ukraine, you know, everybody has a different opinion here. I know, that's Ukraine one of the is the stories. Yeah, this is the most the pluralistic country, country here. Uh, but I think uh, the idea was saying that, like, we would understand because the reason we would fight the Russia and we would win Russia uh, with the, uh, if it would be just the ground troops, but it's, you know, like the West don't help us to close the skies. So we are pushed to this situation by the West, which is not really helping us with air defense. Uh, and probably if it means some time for us to regroup, that could be expected. By handling uh, with Zelensky with the media, again to say, <laughs> Ukraine is the country where the uh, president cannot handle the media, no way, uh, but he should be very attentive to the public opinion. And somehow in this moment, he really behaves as an average Ukrainian and average Ukrainian feels that, you know, like average Ukrainian with the difference of different political views, but with the values of human life and the values of freedom. So we stick to those values and people thinking, you know, like what should be negotiable, the feeling, the freedom can be negotiated, the right to choose cannot be negotiated, human rights, it's something we need to defend, it's very valuable, let's discuss how we can deal with that. Uh, but I think it's still not the position to negotiate. Um, being uh, partially more on the left side myself, uh, I, with some, let's say, limited respect to the, with due respect to the people, but the limited respect of the opinion in NATO. Uh, I would blame the West for really uh, not uh, letting Ukraine into NATO at the moment when Russia was not so hostile. So the reason we experience what we have is, the, is happening because Putin understood that, you know, he just was building up for the moment when he can invade Ukraine, stop uh, the, uh, if Ukraine was today in NATO, you know, uh, this won't happen. So there is a different uh, side of it. And uh, the story to tell, another one, uh, just being very short and brief, again, that one for me, uh, and which I'm really interested, and it's also about Russian language uh, and the Ukrainian language. I'm learning my country also, in addition to what I knew about it, and I knew quite a lot. But this time, just by accident, I come across Greeks, uh, Jews, Russians, Ukrainians, Jewish community in Dnipro, Romas, uh, Armenians, Georgian, Azerbaijani, all of them here, by the way, used to speak Russian very often, especially like foreign nationalists. They kind of switching very often to Ukrainian today just to you know show this. It's a, I think that there is a bit kind of rethinking of the political nation of Ukraine. Uh, it's also very important to us really understand that the political, the civic identity of Ukraine and uh, you know is different. But I also should also say like in critical situation, even I was not really understanding how multicultural Ukraine is, how in depth this is, and. An Armenian talking to whom I was yesterday told, you know, you, Armenia was, it's them, Ukraine, it's their country. A Georgian who was helping to rebuild the destroyed house and came here from Abkhazia told me that it's my country. The Jewish rabbi who came in 1991 was speaking Russian with me. And he came from Brooklyn, uh, from New York. And he said like, it's my country. And it's and a, a Greek, Billy, millionaire whom I met in Odessa told, it's my country, I speak Russian and Greek, a Bulgarian Russian speaking MP in Odessa told me, it's my country, I'm Ukrainian. And they all try now to speak more and more Ukrainian today <laughs> and to <laughs> declare something. And so should we. Uh, and we have a school, in case you didn't know, uh, here in London. Um, anybody else would like to comment on some of these? Isabel, please. Yeah, so I just wanted to follow on from what Natalie was saying in, in two ways. Um, <clears throat> one is that um, I think since 2014 in particular, this is, this is just my view that um, Ukrainian, being Ukrainian has become more of a mentality rather than a, <clears throat> as maybe a citizenship or a ethnic identity. Um, although it's, you know, those things still play a part, but, um, but yeah, like uh, these, these, these kind of the, the politics of 
uh, you know, being independent, being free thinking and stuff are very, very real in Ukraine. And Ukrainians really don't, um, really don't like, like being oppressed and there's a huge sort of culture like anti-oppression culture um and then to go also to what you were saying about noam chomsky and people like that i mean i think essentially a lot of those people are very marginal figures nowadays that's for, that's for like first of all second of all uh secondly rather um this kind of uh stalinist current on the left um that has existed for you know going back de decades and decades now um, is starting to become even even more marginal so I think we certainly saw it in the Labour Party under under Corbyn in some respects um, and but I but I do think a lot of people are kind of rethinking that uh, in light of what's happening now this kind of like my enemy's enemy is my friend so you know their their first enemy being america and american imperialism therefore russia is somehow uh, i mean you know w was moscow ever socialist you know that i mean these kind of questions like you know that it, now it's the kind of wild capitalist slash now uh I'm not quite sure how to describe the, the current politics that exists there now, but uh, neo imperialism, perhaps. Neo, yeah, neo fascist, I guess. Um, but 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 my point is, I I do think that uh, when people were seeking alternative uh, viewpoints on the world, sometimes they kind of that the this like start these Stalinist currents that that have like gone down through generations in the west like sometimes they, they 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 would be attracted to them but i think now um the kind of the balance of logic has shifted to those people's opinions into thinking you know we don't have to pick one or the other we can have our own opinion and and just to finally go back to natalia's final point about like how pluralistic ukrainian society is and i i also couldn't say uh, there's been lots of different variations of what people think about the negotiations, um, but uh, but but people, you know, people are people do have different opinions, uh, but they are they are sort of, they are tolerant. I would say so. Yeah, that was my last point. Thank you, Isabel. Um, Ole and uh, Stas, I'm sure you have comments as well, but just hold those thoughts. I will collect a few more questions, the last round of questions, and I will begin with you, so you will be able to address uh, the new questions and those those comments as well. So, oh, uh, we might be able to do all four, actually. I didn't, mm, maybe not. So, the two <laughs> gentlemen over there, please, uh, want to... I, you've had your hand up for a while. Um, hmm. <laughs> we'll see. Yes, please, yeah. Both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... <laughs> There's negotiations going on here, just to let you know. Yeah. Right, um, yeah I, um, oh, I'm so sorry. Hi, okay. Hi, um, I'm the founder of um, workpermit.com and immigrationboards.com. Immigrationboards.com is the most popular site for discussion on UK visas, um, which I, you know, I think is a valuable resource. It's free. We have not. We don't charge any money for it. So you know, if people from you know, refugees, whoever you know, they can have a discussion free of charge. Um, I uh, what other connection? I have a connection with um, East Europe uh, or, or Northern Europe, anyway. As I met a Latvian barmaid many years ago. We have a daughter, so I have a half. It's a lasting connection. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Latvia, not Ukraine, I'm afraid, but Latvia. That's okay. Um, so I, I wanted to, you know, I, I'm, um, I want to write something more about the uh, refugee situation. I mean, what are, what, to, what comments um, do people have about, uh, you know, what the world is doing about refugees? And also, I, I'm not sure whether I should mention it here, but do people also think it's unfair that in a way ukrainians I, I i appreciate that you know ukraine obviously i'm very sympathetic towards ukraine uh, but um that they are getting priority in a way and the other refugees from other countries uh, are not you know uh, uh, they're not getting much help as you know ukraine ukraine has been um in some respects you know fortunate in that you know countries are giving them more help than than other refugees i think we understood your question they're just really conscious of time so let's collect yeah. a few okay. more thank you yeah Thanks, yeah uh, sir behind you yeah hi, mm -hmm. hi my name is jonathan trofimov i'm the son of uh Yaroslav trofimov uh, who works for the wsj 
So my question is more about the future um, in terms of what will happen, what do you believe will happen um, in say five years time, 10 years time? Do you think Ukraine can reclaim Crimea, in the Eastern regions and who will succeed Putin? Uh, <laughs> An easy question I, I there. I believe that Russia cannot win this war. And with a lot of what Abramovich is doing, do you think he's having an eye on possibly being the future leader? Interesting. Yeah, what and are the of Russia? excellent. Thank you. A question down here. Sorry, Nina, all the way down here in the second row. Thank you so much. Alona Cherkaska, Dobry Vecher. Um, hello. I'm sorry, I have Ukrainian heritage, but I don't speak any Ukrainian. That's okay. <laughs> um, I think we're, it's more of a comment rather than a question, and I think much of it is about fatigue and remaining relevant and really keeping the story fresh and i think it what worries me about framing a question that way is that um we're not in the business of entertainment we're really in the business of reporting story and reporting from the front lines and not necessarily engaging the audience so that we keep our ratings up i think the most important thing is to really the, the story is going to go on because it has massive economic and political um, ramifications. And as of today, there are 13 and a half million displaced people internally and internationally. So in terms of understanding what the Ukrainian community is like, in terms of understanding the power of the Ukrainian language and the poetry underneath, I think the world is awakening to what a giant Ukraine is in terms of culture, in terms of its potential, in terms of its strength, in terms of how, how much its people can contribute to global community. So the cost of it is tremendous. However, um, that's my only sort of silver lining in this entire Great. sort of story. Thank you. Thank you. And since that was a comment, there was another question at the back, so let's take it. Yeah. Hi, thank you for including my question. My name is Oksana Pizhik. Um, I'm Ukrainian-Canadian. Uh, we just did a fundraiser for Ukraine that uh, raised 45,000 pounds. So uh, um, <clears throat> one thing that everyone in this room can do is continue to uh, send funds and do their part. Um, but I guess one of the questions I have is how do we make it more clear that the destiny or fate of the West is actually tied to this threat of democracy within Ukraine and that it is uh, this polarization, this division, uh, even going back to, because actually my area of expertise is within global health and uh, COVID-19 and a lot of the anti-vaxxer information has now moved on. The bots are all focusing on bio labs in Ukraine. So how do we shut down this Kremlin information machine uh, effectively and we have I guess a room full of journalists who should be pros at this so over to you so, uh, great thanks also, so perhaps friend, this, uh, that's... you're you're a converse, like you're in the wrong talk like for sure like you're in the wrong conversation not to be an asshole but yes. <laughs> the discussion continues here it's a shame you're not in the room to see it um but that's probably the sort of question we can discuss later so um i'm afraid we don't have much time and we will need to let our speakers go so these will be the last questions the first one was about refugee crisis and truly is a crisis i don't think it's fair to ask our speakers to comment on the situation in the uk because they're not based here i mean i'm sure you all know the uk has been let's just say modest in the numbers that it's allowed to enter uh, so far in comparison with other countries but I think something that you could maybe comment on is the, 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 the I mean as we heard it's over 10 million displaced people already and of course the vast majority are displaced within the country so I'm sure you're witnessing this already and also those who are leaving and and, and are settling in neighboring countries It'd be great to hear from you uh, your observations uh, the, the the other two questions were about the future who's going to succeed Putin I want to know what you're going to answer to that and you know what Ukraine is likely to look like in 10 15 uh, 10, uh, five to ten years especially the borders um, yeah and the final the final comment was about misinformation so if you have any final um, thoughts about that you could uh, tell us those as well let's begin with those people who were not part of the the conversation in the previous round. So, Olya, let's start with you and then Stas. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, make a very short comment on the previous question about like uh, people like Chomsky and Marshmire. Uh, so, I think that the fundamental problem with, you know, the articles and statements by these people is that they overlook Ukraine's agency and Ukrainians' agency. You know, they are thinking in terms of this like great power struggles between like Russia and NATO and or the US. 
and very often Ukrainians are missing from the equation. And this is, I think, uh, th that's a huge mistake. And, and, and actually with this resistance that Ukrainians are demonstrating, they are showing that uh, their agency shouldn't be overlooked, you know, that they are agents, that they have a voice, that they have their desires and their aspirations. And, and I, frankly, I detest these conversations in which Ukraine is missing. So that's just my answer. You know, Ukrainians have a voice and the, the primary objective should be like to listen to what Ukrainians want and to, uh, uh, you know, what they have to say. Uh, and it's true that Ukrainian voices are, there are more of them now, but they are still not enough in this debate. And uh, passing to uh, other, other questions, uh, and also like slightly touching on the on the question of like what kind of stories I think uh, there should be more. Uh, actually, I, it's it's interesting that the topic of refugees and internally displaced was addressed because I think that's one of the stories that also should be maybe reported more. Uh, and especially like I'm I'm based here in Western Ukraine, so I'm I'm an IDP myself, and I'm we are hosting other IDPs in our house, and I've seen how this town in which I'm staying has been like overflowing with every passing week with more and more IDPs. And basically like when you go now to a supermarket on a park and you see cars with number plates from all regions of Ukraine, you know, it's like huge variety, people from Kharkiv, people from Odessa, Zaporizhia, uh, and, and you know, the Nesk region, Luhansk region, like Kyiv. Uh, so all parts of Ukraine and, and, and the burden actually, like the, the main burden is still it's still on Ukraine of, you know, like you know, providing um, accommodation to uh, to people who are fleeing from the war because the majority actually are staying. Yeah, we know that the number of internally displaced is like twice as much as the number of refugees also because only uh, women and children are allowed to, to leave the country and a lot of men uh, are staying in Ukraine. They move to the Western part with their families. Um, uh, so, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and it's not enough, there is not enough accommodation for all of them, and people are also, like, here in Western Ukraine, they, they saw their lives, like, appended with this huge influx of, you know, people from all over the country who need accommodation, who need um, uh, places to, to stay, and, you know, the logistics is not adequate, so it's also a story that maybe is not told uh, enough and, and some other stories that should be told I think these are human stories of course like there are ordinary people who are you know participating in this resistance on different levels not just on the front line not just the soldiers but so many civilians in in different parts of the country who are contributing to this resistance in in the ways they can uh, so yeah th these are my remarks and I will leave the flo floor to other speakers to add thank you Ola Stas any comments on any of those questions? I particularly want to hear about your predictions of the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I just wanted to say something about this. I think that, regarding the character of the question, in Europe, they don't really understand what's going on in Europe. That's exactly the question I wanted to take, because judging by the, by the color of the question, it's, it seems that people in Europe still don't understand very well what's going on here. Тут запитали, що буде з Україною через 5-10 років, то я переформулював і запитав, а що буде з вами через 5-10 років? So the, the question that asks what's going to happen to Ukraine in 5-10 years, I would reformulate that question, turn it around and ask what's going to be happening to you in 5-10 years. Хто з вас з країн ЄС буде приймати поляків та литовців у себе, якщо завтра Україна не існує? Who of you of, of the EU countries will accept Polish or Lithuanian refugees in five to ten years if Ukraine is gone? Невже в Європі досі хтось має ілюзію, що ця війна про НАТО та Україну? Does anyone in Europe still have the illusion that this war is about NATO and Ukraine? Формула ми напали, тому що інакше б напали на нас, вона взагалі абсурдна і може бути застосована будь-де і будь-коли будь-ким, будь-якою країною. The formulation of we attacked because if we hadn't they might have attacked us, which is what Russia says. Russia's justification is absurd and can be used whenever anywhere anytime by anybody anywhere in the world. Але при цьому виникає питання, чому Просто стирається з лиця землі русскомовний Маріуполь та Харків. But still, 
even if we grant that premise, we have to raise the question of why Russian speaking Mariupol or Kharkiv are being wiped off the face of the earth. Why does the Orthodox Russia bomb Svatogirsk, which is a monastery of Moscow Patriarchy? And why do they speak about net Nazis when our president is Jewish? Тому я просто закликав Європу зрозуміти, що це зіткнення світу тирану зі світом свободним в широкому сенсі цього слова. І Україна в цьому сенсі, в якому сенсі, так тут випадковість, і Росія на нас точно не зупиниться. I want I call on Europe. I ask Europe to understand that this is a conflict between tyranny and freedom. And in that sense, Ukraine is just there accidentally and russia will not stop at ukraine і слава богу що хоча по польщі це почали розуміти бо створюють вже територіальну оборону самі thank god people in poland are trying, uh, starting to understand that because they're already forming their own territorial defenses Дякую. thank you а, можливо у вас є коментарі про якісь інші на якісь інші запитання теж стасу поки ви тут uh, ну, власне, я вже частково відповів про російську мову і про українську, як ніби, як діалект uh, російської. Ну, це теж абсурдно. I feel like I've answered a little bit about the Russian and Ukrainian languages and this whole thing about Ukrainian language being a dialect of Russian, it's absurd. Uh, щоб ви розуміли, у нас є діє неформальне правило, коли перетинаєш блокпости у Києві, ми спілкуємось виключно українською, тому що російські диверсанти її не розуміють. We have this unwritten rule that when you're going through checkpoints in Kyiv, we talk to each other exclusively in Ukrainian because Russian saboteurs do not understand it. І звичайно казати, що українська мова це діалект російської, те саме можна сказати і про українську націю, це, ну, іде від людей, в яких досі у свідомості є Радянський Союз, Москва, а потім існують всі інші. And to say that Ukrainian language is a dialect of Russian, it, it's kind of like saying that it's the same that, as to say that Ukrainian nation is an offspring of Russian nation and comes from people in whose minds the Soviet Union still exists and there is Moscow first and everything else later. Варто вже зрозуміти, що ми інша країна, інший народ з іншою мовою. It is time to understand that we are a different country and different people with a different language. І, до речі, росіяни, я думаю, що скоро це зрозуміють скоріше, ніж в Європі, тому що ми їх просто вбиваємо. And I think Russians might come to this understanding sooner than people in Europe, because we are killing them. Дякую, Стаса. Наталя і Ізабел, just before we wrap up, wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to anything that you might not have responded to yet. Yeah, I think I want to finish on the future and this idea of help um i think that the, the, again like i'm foreign correspondent myself i reported on syria i reported on the other conflicts and i feel extremely you know bad to kind of compare and to say that somebody deserves more humanity i don't want it to be the competition it's not the competition it shouldn't be everybody deserves support uh, what is different I mean, and, and, and it's not like the excuse for that, uh, but in case of Ukraine, there is the difference is that there is a strong chances, and we see that, that Ukraine can win. It's possible, it's doable, and even legitimately, a lot of conflicts, they are inner conflicts, not always, like not every, but often like with, with, with the conflict in different countries, the people are fleeing from their dictator or something. And of course the world, world has no, uh, you know, either authority or the rules are written in the way that they would help in humanitarian way, but they cannot help those people to, you know, fight their tyrant. Um, you know, uh, really, in case of Ukraine, we're speaking about a really very classical war between the countries the breach of sovereignty of the international rules and the huge will and already already showing kind of track of track of success so when we're speaking about the refugees it's it we're really here for something to stop it as soon as possible and there are means in the world to help ukraine to stop it 
So therefore, this is the best way the refugees should be cared. But there are a lot of coming, like really for short term, because even the place where Ola is in Chernivtsi couldn't be fully saved. So it's better and it's also might be exhausted. So they are coming for some time to go away from a very imminent threat by which I mean the air bombs, not really like repressions or something, air bombs, which can be held. Uh, so I do think that we, we really put frame the idea how we can help Ukraine to win in any ways. And that would be a different framework and the difference of this particular war. And again, on uh, I would maybe make it a bit different from what Stas said. It's not what will happen to Poland or to Lithuania, but it's a question whether we want to live in the world where the force has became the really the most important, uh, you know, um, uh, reason for the country do this or that, or will we would be able to stay in the world where rules and laws matters? We are here really on this edge that it's possible. It could be again Russia, but could be not Russia, but any other country which would see that. By the way, it's possible to occupy another country. It was impossible. We thought it was over in 1945. Um, and I said like for a long time, I was quite reluctant to kind of compare the world, the, the, the wars. So it, it's something about what would be with the world. If, we, if Ukraine win, we probably are been back to the civilized world if something going wrong and we are really i think that you know like if something won't work but i don't want to think that it's not not the world we want to live all uh, then probably we will we we can kind of reach any type of anti utopia we couldn't imagine five or, or any you know like a month ago you know that's how i would see the world as in any anti utopian movie um so that would be my kind of uh final final words Thank you, Natalia. Isabel? Uh, yeah, just very quickly, I just wanted to talk about meeting one of my friends. I was driving through um, a town near Kiev uh, where he happened to live. And so, of course, I, I rang him and I wanted to see him. Um, and he came out and he said, I just don't understand. And this is what everybody keeps saying, but I just don't understand. Why don't they help us close the skies? Like, you know, how many children need to die? But then the last thing that he said, which kind of struck me, more uh, well actually you know it wasn't whatever you know it was you know we we all live so well we were living so well mm -hmm. and and of course like you know ukraine had its problems or whatever but you know it's a it's a you know it is a beautiful country just objectively speaking and um you know it was a place where the the people themselves are, 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 are peaceful i mean obviously we've had the the, the war since 2014 in the east but um that as i said at the beginning that was a manufactured conflict um and not something that just like this war it's not something that the ukrainians asked for so yeah i think for me that's the thing is like you know we were all living so well and then this mm -hmm. Thank you, Isabel. And, and I think that those thoughts that you all raised are perhaps uh, really important thoughts to finish this discussion on. I mean, we've all talked a lot about what we can learn about Ukraine and from Ukraine. And that's, um, I think, one of the key sort of takeaways from me is that we have been learning um, that Ukrainians are fighting f to have a future and a very clear future, a future that uh, does not have space for oppression, uh, authoritarianism, dictatorship, but actually is the future where freedom can be practiced. Um, and that is a question for us to answer here. What sort of future are we prepared to defend here? Because we really need to be doing it now and not wait um, uh, until we are in the situation like Ukraine has found itself in. Um, so I really want I want to thank uh, all of you for coming here tonight. I want to thank Nina Watson and the Frontline Club for hosting us. I'd really like to thank Nina Murray and Irene Nozemtsova for um, interpreting for us today. And Maria Montague, my colleague, and Katya, the volunteer. Sorry, Katya, I don't remember your last name. That's why I'm not saying it. <laughs> um, for for uh, for helping us run this. And most of all, I want to 
to thank all of our speakers, Stanislav Asseyev, Olya Tukariuk, Natalia Humaniuk, and Isabel Koshev for spending this valuable time with us and sharing your insights from Ukraine um, about Putin's war in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Please follow their work, follow, read their writing. Uh, they're all on social media um, and yeah, st stay in touch with them that way. Thank you. And of course, many thanks to all of you who joined us via Zoom.